God got a hold of my life when I was 17 years old. Now, I was a hard-drinking, hard-swearing youth. I'll admit that. And God put a crazy Pentecostal woman in my path. Now, a lot of us Pentecostal men need to say amen to that. Because if it wasn't for a crazy Pentecostal woman that you may have started dating, you wouldn't be here right now. Amen? And so God put this woman in my, in my path, young woman at the time, and I'm going to have her stand up because this is the young woman that God put in my path. This is my wife, Cheryl. And you see, if God had not put her in my path, I'd either be wearing prison white or I'd be six foot under because that was the direction I was going. God put her in my path. I got saved in a mission service November 5th, 1978. God got a hold of my life. I went to an altar. I can take you to the church in Mount Home, Arkansas. Of course, now it's a warehouse for a mattress company. But I can take you to that old church and I can show you where the altar was at. And I can show you exactly where I met Jesus Christ face to face. And then a few months later, I got called to go into the ministry. And having not grown, grown up in this type of a church, I grew up in a mainline church. I really didn't know what to do, so I went to my wife and I said, I feel God's calling me into the ministry. And her and her mom said, well, all new Christians feel that way. You, you need to go talk to our pastor. So I went and talked to our pastor, and the first thing out of his mouth was, you need to go to Bible college. I didn't know. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking maybe this is just me. And so for five years, I didn't take my call because I'm a little thick-headed, okay? So in 1984, God renewed that call in my life. I accepted the, the call into ministry, started doing ministry. Pastor at my first church when I was 25, I, I knew everything <laughs> at 25. Amen. And then took my second church, and while we were in that second church, between the two churches, I started doing prison ministry quite unexpectedly. See, I didn't want anything to do with inmates. I didn't like them. But I had a reason for it. I had a family member. I had a nephew that went to prison. And seeing the games that he played on my mom and dad and on my sister, my thoughts were, let him sit there and rot. I don't care. Now, folks, let's be honest. We've all felt that way. Right? Come on. I'm not the only one here that's felt that way. But, folks, Jesus died for them. He sacrificed his life so that they could have life and have it more abundantly. Well, there was a man doing prison ministry in our church, and uh, he, uh, he got up and resigned, gave it to another man. That man came to me a week later and said, I don't have time for this. I've got a new business I'm starting. It's yours. I went to the altar again. I said, Lord, do you know what you're asking of me? Well, guess what? The Lord didn't know what he was asking of me. Because the first time I went to the county jail and spoke, I saw eight men and two women come forward for salvation. And I was hooked. The first time I went to the local prison that was close to the town we lived in, I saw 40 men come forward for salvation. And that night I went to that chaplain and I said, at some point in my life I will be a prison chaplain. I knew exactly where God was calling me. Well, I became a missionary prison chaplain to the Arkansas Department of Corrections in the year of 2001. And since then, I have been working with inmates in some form or fashion. In 2009, God kicked me out of the units. I spent three months seeking His will, and then all of a sudden one day the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart about prison ministry at Global University. Now for those of us that, are, that have been in the Assemblies of God long enough, if you remember ICI, which was the International Correspondence Institute, which was in Brussels, Belgium, they came to the United States in the 90s and started working here, and in the late 90s they joined with Berean University and they became Global University. Well the materials that they developed overseas, the discipleship materials, is, are being sent into inmates for free to disciple them into the body of Christ. Because one of the things I would hear from inmates was, chap, I just got saved. How do I live this? You see, folks, we've got a biblically illiterate generation out here now. That's right. We've got men and women that did not grow up with, with the same Bible stories you and I grew up with. They didn't grow up in church. They didn't know what it was to, to, to be in a church. I had a porter who told me one time, that in all the years that he was alive, he went to church twice before he came to prison. And here's the thing, folks. He was from Tunica, Mississippi, in the middle of the Bible Belt. And yet, in his whole life, and he was 40-something years old until he came to prison, he'd only been to church twice. So, folks, there's people out there that need discipling. Yes, and so what we are doing at Global University 
And let me, let me give you my big fancy title. You know, with Assemblies of God, we like our big fancy titles. I'm the Assistant National Director for Prison Ministries at Global University in Springfield, Missouri. Somebody asked me not long after I got that title, well, what does that do for you? I said, that title and three dollars get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> I'm not big on titles. What I am big on is seeing lives transformed. Amen. And what I do is I run the day-to-day -day operations of the ministry. Right now, and I'm just going to pull out my little piece of paper so I don't, I don't evangelically increase the numbers here. Right now, uh, in the national office, we have 2,756 English-speaking students that are doing our studies. We have 461 Hispanic students that are doing our studies through the national office of Global University. So we have over 3,200 inmates doing that. We have one man doing it in simplified Chinese. I just got a hold of another ministry, and we're going to try to start some people in Vietnamese doing these studies. You see, folks, God is trying to reach around the world, and he's doing it here in the United States, and he's doing it in our prisons. And what we are doing, not only are we discipling them, but there's 18 books that are what we call ministry leadership training courses. And what this teaches them to do is do the ministry right where they're at. We get letters from them all the time. I just can't wait till I get out of prison, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to... Uh, I'm gonna Go out and do the ministry, and we just we write it back and say, do the ministry right where you're at. Right. What better place to do it than in a dark place like a prison? We are very fortunate here in Arizona. We have an extension center of us that takes care of all of the prisons and jails here in Arizona for us. Uh, they have, I think the last last thing I saw, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not speaking evangelically here. Uh, I believe they've got about 500 students right now that are doing these studies. They are the only prison ministry that is allowed to bring the materials into Maricopa County. Now that's, that's how important we look at this. And so we are seeing God moving and touching in the lives. Let me give you the testimony of one man. We received a letter in, 20, in 2011. My wife takes care of uh, sending out the application letters that we send to them and then sending them out the first study. And the first study we send them. Now this this pamphlet here is probably was probably printed somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s. It's now more of a book, but I wanted to bring this. I, I carried this with me, and it's called The Great Questions of Life. Conservatively, it's estimated over 2 million people have come to Jesus Christ by this one book that was written by a, a missionary uh, out in the field. And so my wife will send out this book right here. This is the first book they received. In our ministry in the last seven years, over 5,000 men and women have come to Jesus Christ, not only because of this book, but the other books that we send to them. And so my wife answered his letter, sent him the application. He sent it back. She sent him the first book, The Great Questions of Life. Everybody starts at this book. We don't care if you have a doctorate in theology. You will start with The Great Questions of Life. He comes back with the book, and there's a letter in there, and this is what the letter says. I'm a Satanist, and I've been a Satanist for over 30 years. I don't regret my choices. The only reason I'm doing these studies is so I can pad my jacket so it looks good for the parole board. However, would you pray for my family? They're all in prison. <laughs> okay. But as my wife has kind of told me, at least the man believes in prayer. <laughs> Amen. So when I heard this prayer request, I asked for this man, I asked for the prayer request. And I hung it up in my office wall. Where it still hangs right now, it's taped to my office wall. And every day when I'd go in my office, I'd put my hand on that request. And I would pray not only for the man's family, I'd pray for him. God, get a hold of his life. Turn him around. He went all the way through the discipleship, all 18 books. We start him in the next, the first series of books on Christian leadership. Now, to grade them, we have to have all the tests come in and out of the back of the book. The Christian leadership book's a little bit bigger. There's three tests. He sends in one test, and we don't see anything else. Well, what we do is we attach that to an envelope, and we put it in a file, and we wait. Well, they came in about October of 2011. Excuse me, October of 2012. The first, le first lesson came in April of 2013. I'm working in the office. Now, I run the operation. I, it's part of my job, but I also help 
when help is needed. This was right after Easter, so we're off Good Friday and and of course, come Monday, we've got a bunch of mail, so I'm in there helping them. I'm opening up uh, the mail, I'm helping them open up, get it ready, and I happen to see this guy's, this, this man's envelope. We're gonna call him Fred. And I said, see Fred's envelope here, and I say, okay, I know where that other one is, and I go over to the file, and I pull it out, and I pull the first sheet off, and on that envelope, with the original envelope that came in, it said, saved. I said, what? Turn that thing over. And it said, July of this year, 2012, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Folks, that's why we do what we do. It's to transform lives, folks. Because if we can get them transformed in prison, and we can keep them from going back, it saves you and me money. Amen. Amen? Amen. And so that's what we're trying to do, is radically transform their lives. Not only are we doing that, but we have partnered with a ministry in Warrington, Missouri. I met some people from Warrington that have moved here from Warrington called Child Evangelism Fellowship. And we have partnered with them, and we send an application with a lot of our lessons that they can sign up their children and their grandchildren, their nieces and nephews, their neighbors' kids, they don't really care, we'll just send it to them. Over 2,700 kids, we've been partnering for four years now, over 2,700 kids have received age-appropriate material to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Folks, because we need to impact their families as well. It doesn't do us any good to, to change that inmate's life if they go back to the same home life they had. So we're just trying to impact their lives. So what we're doing right now, folks, we're out. I really don't even call this itinerating anymore. We're just trying to get the story out of what God is doing. I have to raise, I need to raise about $200 more in my budget, my monthly budget, which is this part of my budget is my work budget. And so what we're doing is, is we're asking for two things. Number one, would you pray for us? Now I drove all the way here from Missouri. We left six inches of snow <laughs> Thursday. It has since iced twice since we've left. And I gotta go back to that sometime in the, within a week. I've got to head back that way. But we're speaking at, we are speaking at Harvest Church Wednesday night. I'll leave here Friday. I will drive to El Paso, get, go visit my youngest grandson. Thank you, Lord, for grandchildren. Amen. 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 All the grandparents said amen. amen. Yes. Amen. Grandchildren are great yes. because they're not yours. Yeah. Amen. You spoil them and you give them back to mom and dad. That's great. See, I had four sons. I have three grandsons. Apparently there's no female genes on this side of the family. I'm looking for that first granddaughter and Lord help the couple has the first granddaughter. Because grandma here loves to shop and I can almost imagine what the clothing, what the clothing bill is going to look like when the first granddaughter comes. We're going to go play with our grandson, but while I'm in El Paso, I'm also preaching at a church. I do a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, or a Sunday morning, two Sunday morning services an afternoon service in a prison to the general population and I go back in the next day and speak to the faith-based pod. So would you pray that God would, would touch the lives of those men that I'm going to go speak to? Because I, I want to see lives transformed. And of course we've got to drive back home and then we've got other places we will be going. All of my march is full. I mean, I'm somewhere every weekend preaching. So just pray as we're out traveling. The other thing is, could you help us with that $200? What I need is 20 people give me $10 a month, and I'm done. $10 in monthly support, and I'm done. Or if you'd like to give $200 a month, I'll be happy with that too. <laughs> Whatever you could do to help us, we would appreciate it. But the most important thing is, folks, God is bringing a revival to the prisons. Amen. Lives are being transformed. Would you help us to reach out and to touch the lives of those men and women that are desperately needing a change in their life? They've tried everything else. What better thing to give them than Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to have the tech crew mad at me because I just about broke a microphone just then. <laughs> um, I want to ask our ushers to come. And we're going to receive an offering right now. This is a love offering towards the ministry of Scott and Cheryl Long. And they do have needs. And as a, a missions couple, he just put the need out before you. Uh, as a church family, we are...